was born in 1967, uh, two days before Halloween, in New Orleans East. We didn't have a lot of money growing up, so I was raised very, in a very negative family. Uh, my father was an alcoholic, um, and it was just a, 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 it was, it was a loving family, but it's weird because it's loving, but it's, it was, it was pretty rough. Um, so that negativity is just bred into you from day one. So big warrior, my mom's the biggest warrior ever. I didn't have a lot of guidance along the way. I had a lot of my own. Um, my parents were, they loved us. I mean, you know, loved us to death. Never question any of that, but you know, they, their philosophy was different. They just led us on our own. Went to a, a local Catholic school in the neighborhood. So most of the kids from New Orleans East either split between Brother Martin and Holy Cross. It was the awesome school. Turned out great, best years of my life by, by far. From the minute that I walked on that campus, my love for that school is, is just, I can't even explain it. Uh, it's just a special place. It was, a old, it was an old college campus. It was really a big college campus um, down on, the, it wasn't in a great neighborhood, but uh, it was just so beautiful. Still to this day, the hardest I've ever been hit in my life was in seventh grade by a, a football coach that was a history teacher, hit me in the face with a big thick book. You learn your lesson, you don't do anything, but you know, no, nope, you don't cause any trouble. The fifth graders are treated like the seniors, their own lockers and, you know, uh, had to learn where the classrooms were and how to get to them and change classes every day and, you know, every period. You know, my, my graduating class is very small. A pack of rats, they call us. We still all friends today. I still hold grudges against, you know, I'm 49 years old and I will not allow any Jesuit, no one's coming to my house with Jesuit gear on. Sorry. That was the year I graduated high school, it was 1985, so he, uh, 186 pound topping. My, my grandfather and my father were big fishermen, so I followed that tradition and fished with them. So we pulled lures all day and, and uh, probably for 12 hours, and didn't get a hit, and we were, we were running low on gas, so we ran into Grand Isle, and we were gonna go home. But we were running back through, and uh, one of Dad's friends told him, you know, talked him into staying, and uh, put the lines down, and he hit at seven o'clock at night. We got him in at 8.05, but the, but the uh, the scales closed at eight, so we couldn't wait until the next day. So I stayed up all night keeping him wet. We wrapped him in a, a, a towel, and then we estimated him a lot smaller than he was. We estimated about 150, but uh, there was an engineer on a boat that was, uh, he came up with a formula, and he was three boats down from us. So he came and looked at him. He's like, that's a bigger fish than y'all think. So he said, let me get my tape measure. So he measured him all up and went in the cabin for like 10 minutes of his boat and came back, and he said, uh, that fish weighs about 193 pounds. There's a 185 pound fish on the, uh, on the board right now, which is a big, you know, usually you don't beat that. Um, and I think this fish is gonna lose about seven pounds. So you're gonna be right there. So I think he was exactly right on. Uh, I, think, I think it was 187. So it was exact, he had the exact number just by measure. We were, we, were the, we were playing a big boy's game, a big rich people's game and with no money. So, when well, they looked down on us, but we were kind of the, the laughing stock, you know. And we caught some fish, but not like the big, you know, the big boats. But uh, it only takes one. We had, we had four generations of printers. We had our own printing company. And I went, I was in the printing company when I was, from when I was 13 on. So I just went right out of, I tried to go to school for a year, but uh, I succeeded in, in, in having a good time and not schoolwork. And started working for the printing company and uh, two years in, it wasn't going to work with my father. Um, <laughs> so. I left uh, and went and ran a big million dollar a general manager for a, a production manager for a big printing company in, uh, in Metairie and uh, was there for five years, was supposed to buy that and it got sold out from under us. So I started my own company. Um, I knew I could, I could do it so I just went and talked to my customers and they all came with me so that's where I started. I did everything. I uh, did all the artwork, um, computer work, billing, deliveries by myself, you know, 14, 15 hours a day, six days a week, I took one day off. Um, for about three years, two and a half years, I doubled in size. I just hired my first three guys, um, real talented guys, and, uh, and Katrina came calling. It's just part of our life, you know? But it's, it'll always be a, the major part of our life, you know? Once I had children, I just told myself, any hurricane, we're gone. I don't, I don't need to be a hero and, and fight all that stuff. I'll be smart and, uh, the storm wasn't supposed to be coming here, and we, we had just gotten back from Destin. So, when I saw it was gonna, you know, when, it, when, it, when the writing was on the wall, I don't hesitate, I go. So, 
packed the kids up like we had done in the past. It's a terrible, terrible feeling leaving your house, but we were on the road within two hours. Um, and we left way before everybody else. So um, we're about, it was about a 10 hour trip because we had to go up through Monroe. And my brother lives in Dallas, so that's where we're headed. So we get there and the storm hits and it seemed like it was gonna be all right, but there was no communication. And I got my first text. And my first text was the day after the storm. And it said, uh, it still gives me chills to this day. Um, it said, uh, 14 feet of water and dead bodies at the shop. That was it. I drove back, I left my family in Dallas. I drove back, I guess, two weeks later to get to the house. Um, and I could barely get to, the house, to our house in Mandeville because there's so many trees down. Uh, I, it just blew me away, I couldn't believe what I saw. And then I went to, to Waveland and I really couldn't see what I saw, believe what I saw. Um, you take things for granted. You take cell phone use for granted. You take, you know, water, food. Um, but when street signs are gone and houses are gone, you don't even know where you, you don't even know where yet. So, got, you know, my work, the guys that I was working with, we couldn't find the houses. You know, when you lose something that you worked that hard for, uh, you don't know how you're going to take it. Uh, people, people always tell you, oh, let's let it go. It's not, it doesn't work that way, you know. Um, and I didn't handle it well. I got depressed by it and everything. And, and you know, I didn't go out and gamble. Uh, you know, I didn't go out and do drugs and lose my business. I, it wasn't anything that I really caused. So that was hard for me. Yeah. Couldn't get any help, basically, because um, I had 18 years of perfect credit, but I paid off my, uh, my business loans. And we were left, all my equity and everything was in. I had a $250,000 business loan, and my insurance check was for 249 So. It, it didn't even touch my hands, it went right to the bank. So it paid off everything, which is, is a good thing, but um, it took us about 11 months to recreate the, the, the business records because the bank, there was nothing left. In that time that it took, I'm working, so I, uh, there was no work, you know, digging, you know, cleaning up stuff, and, um, and my 18 years of home, perfect credit started to take a beating, and SBA came in at the 10 month mark and said, we don't basically don't care if you had eight, you know, 18 years of um, good credit. Your credit's not good since the storm. And all I needed was my original loan back to get back up and running. Um, so I had to do the right thing for myself, and I tried to keep it running for two years out of my house. Um, and, and, and was, you know, barely holding on. And it just got to the point where it just got so hard that uh, with all the financial difficulty thrown in, I had to do something. So. I started looking for a job and uh, I got lucky I got an interview and I guess the guy felt, felt a little bad for me and hired me as a, a sales rep. So um, went to work selling janitorial supplies. Had to learn all that whole business. Um, it was a lot more difficult than I thought it would be. So we were owned by Interline Brands. We had a parent company. We like to say we were the biggest company that no one knew. Um, we were a three billion dollar company, but there was 12 companies that fell under the umbrella. So there was no brand name recognition like a Staples or a Granger or something like that. So um, Goldman Sachs bought us as an investment. And when they do that, they either, they either rip the companies apart and sell them or they pump money into them and sell them. Uh, Home Depot came in and bought us eight months ago. So we're gonna be the, the, the subsidiary company. We'll keep our name, but we have, you know, we got the, we're owned by Home Depot, we have the logos and everything. Um, and it's a two-year integration into their system. I sell, I think I sell 100,000 items. A lot of times I don't even uh, know what I sell anymore. But for me, it fits, it fits my wheelhouse. I feel like I've been given a gift because now I know what exactly in life is important and it's not that much. You know, I had a big house and the SUVs and, you know, status and gone a day. Everything that I thought was important was the most least important, you know, it's not important at all. I, I can honestly say that I would not change a thing as hard as it was. And it was absolutely, it still is absolutely brutal. I'd like my friends to say that I was a good friend and I'd like my kids to say that I was a good father. And I know those two things now, so I'm good.